Hey, Salt Lake. I was sitting up on the roof of the shop this morning, writing some emails, drinking a little coffee, and thinking what a fun place it would be for a party. Skyline views, a fire pit, even room for a dance floor. How about hosting your spring or summer events at the shop? Anyone can have an extraordinary event there because their spaces are thoughtfully designed and their community team helps with the planning. For more details and a virtual tour, visit shopworkspace.com. It's Emily Means filling in for host Ali Vallarta, and here's what Salt Lake's talking about. The International Olympic Committee is here this week touring our venues because SLC is the preferred host for the 2034 Winter Games. Now, 10 years may seem like a long time, but Senator Mitt Romney says we better start planning right now because the Olympics is like 50 Super Bowls, just massive. Luckily, we got a head start last spring when Allie had a friendly debate with an Olympian and the chair of Salt Lake's bid about the merits of bringing back the games. So did she convince Allie to believe in the Olympic dream? It's Tuesday, April 9th, and this is CityCast Salt Lake. Catherine Rainey Norman, you are the chair of the Salt Lake City Olympic Committee for the Games. Now, I have developed quite a reputation on this show for being opposed to Salt Lake's Olympic bid, but I do think that if there is anyone on this earth that can change my mind, it is you, a four-time Olympian and Hall of Famer. So tell me about what makes you believe in the games. Like, what's your Olympics origin story? Oh, my goodness. Well, yes, I'm going to make you a believer. (laughs) I'm re- I'm buckled in. I grew up watching the Olympic Games and I grew up admiring those athletes and really honestly dreaming like I wanted to become one. Yeah. thought I was going to be a ski racer and then kind of reality checked in on like a field trip to the local ski slope in middle of Wisconsin. And I was like, mm, <laughs> probably not going to happen here, but um, yeah. fell in love with skating. And, and I started mm. off as a figure skater and switched into speed skating. It's got deep roots in in Milwaukee and Wisconsin. And and I just kind of was so lucky to chase my dream and to have the people and the support and the infrastructure there to be able to do it. Mm. It's been transformative for me as a person, for my family, to see the community impact. It has kind of just ingrained in me, how can I use the Olympic and Paralympic movement for betterment, to try to make a difference and to try to inspire and get people to believe and get people to dream. Well, let's you and I have a very friendly debate on the Mm -hmm. merits of bringing the games back to Salt Lake City, because one of the things that I think I've experienced a little bit since Salt Lake announced its bid is that as a Salt Laker, and this is me being me, but like, I feel like maybe I wasn't asked if like we I wanted the games or if this was something that I felt was right for the city until later in the process. And so I think that there is tremendous value and tremendous opportunity in you and I having a conversation about some of the key anxieties that I feel and that I've heard about and I'm sure you've heard about as well. My first one is basically capacity. Mm-hmm. Like One of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is like, is this city prepared to welcome the world? And emotionally, sure. But I mean, when we look back at the 2002 Olympic Games, a lot of people credit Utah's, you know, in the past 10 years, population explosion to the 02 Olympics. Some Park City residents have already expressed that they're anxious about their capacity to host the Games. Do we actually have the infrastructure and the resources to do this again? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think we are even better prepared than we were in 02. And Mm -hmm. that's taking into account our growth that we have seen. Um, I think the NBA All-Star Game was a great example of us as a city being able to have the capacity to pull off a major sporting event. I think we see it every single year with Sundance quite honestly. It's a global international film festival where we we welcome people from across the world and goes on for many, many days. So I think we have the capacity to be able to do this. I think we have the infrastructure to be able to do it. And I think most importantly, we have the people to be able to do this. People are so 
excited to kind of roll up their sleeves and be a part of this. Since 2002, we have been doing polling with our community and trying to understand where their attitude lies around a games. And since 02, so for over 20 years, we've had polling at 75% or higher. Hmm. And so we have continually looked throughout the years as to where where did the attitudes stand in terms of a games. And the infrastructure continues to grow, right? I think one of the most beautiful things that came out of 02 was tracks. Right. Salt Lake City 2002 was the impetus for mass transit in Utah. And to be able to have that as a legacy infrastructure that continues to benefit our community today. And so as we are looking forward to potentially hosting a games in 2030 or 34, we're really trying to work closely with key stakeholders across the community, political, business, and what's on the horizon for the city. And how can we use a games to either help be a catalyst for that? What are some of the concerns that our community has? And how can we either help to mitigate those concerns or help to be an advocate around some of those concerns? You can't make everybody happy, but we can make our best effort to move forward with positive intentions from day one. And I think that's what we're really trying to do right now. Yeah. I mean, as you mentioned, I am in the minority. The Olympic dream is pretty popular with Utahns. But I do have to say, like, I mean, Sundance drives Park City locals crazy. I mean, they complain about Airbnbs. They complain about traffic. And Sundance is drawing, you know, 120, maybe 1,000 people over the course of the festival. The O2 Olympics saw 70,000 people a day. Like Salt Lake doesn't even have public restrooms right now. I mean, we have a bus driver shortage. Who's Mm going to drive all the public transit that we might build for something like this? Again, I think that's where we have to work with our public officials on what policies they're putting forward. And we're continually kind of talking to them about, okay, here's what it could look like for a games. Right. If we have 70,000 people coming into town on any given day, do we have the staffing capacity to move those people in buses? What does the long term plan look like for public restrooms? And and that's obviously an important need in when you host a very large event in any community. And so mm-hmm. we're starting that work now with everybody to say, hold on, if we're hosting the games, here's an impact that it could have. We need to work together to try to solve this. Yeah. Well, and on that note, my sort of second anxiety around the games is hands down one of the biggest crises facing our city right now is a housing crisis that has led to a homelessness crisis. And during the 2002 Olympics, we saw Salt Lake City residents being evicted from low rent homes and motels so that landlords could make a bigger profit off of visitors. And that even predated the Airbnb phenomenon. Yeah. So we were in this massive affordable housing crisis. We still struggle to house our unsheltered residents. I mean, what is the case for how lower income community members benefit from an Olympics? When you host a games, you're talking about thousands of jobs that are going to be created during that time period. And we are obviously taking a close look at local individuals, local procurement for services. So one, you've got job growth that's going to come for a games. Um, when you look at what happened back in 02 with those evictions and trying to raise rates so that they could capitalize during the games, you know, we'll work closely with, with the political officials to make sure and advocate for policy against that so that that can't happen. We can bring a leadership role to some of these hard conversations and challenging issues that are facing our population. We're not a political entity, but our goal is to try to improve our community and have a good impact on our community. So I think that we can be hopefully helpful in some of those conversations and dialogues. It is interesting to me that you are bringing up the idea that the Salt Lake Olympic Committee could push the city or push electeds on some of these issues. Does the committee itself have, I mean, I know you said it's not political, but does it have like a bit of a a philosophy or a manifesto about things like housing and jobs? Because it's sounding like a bit like a third political party to me. I'm like, maybe, maybe that's the right party for me. 
No, no, no. I mean, we are trying to make sure that we follow the guidance of what the IOC is looking at. So things like climate and sustainability, that's a core pillar within the International Olympic and Paralympic Committee. So how can we use a games to help be a catalyst around that and use the resources and the knowledge and the expertise in Utah to exemplify that? I use the analogy quite often that a games is really It's a giant quilt and you have different pieces of the fabric that come together to make it beautiful, right? And so we Mm -hmm. have so many different touch points that we have an impact on within our community um, that we have to be thoughtful about. Well, I mean, you and I both live in Utah and so we know that the city's power is basically very little in the face of the Utah legislature. So when we think about an issue like displacement and housing, You know, cities can't implement rent control, for example. That's up to the legislature. Do you think that the Olympic Committee is potentially a powerful lever with the legislature, more powerful even than than the city to implement these kinds of infrastructure changes? No, I don't think so. Again, we're we're not a political entity. Do we talk to the legislature in terms of what are some of the needs that we're going to have during a Games? We are going to have a a very robust transportation network during a games. And what does that look like in terms of how it's being implemented? How can we use what we're doing during a games for long-term change across the state? Again, I go back to Trax. Trax was a wonderful thing from O2 that had long-lasting impacts. And so those are the things that we are, again, working with local officials, working with state officials, and trying to best understand what are those key priorities that are coming up on the horizon that are important to Utah that may have an impact on a games, and how can we all come to the table together? We talk a lot on this show about our city's crown jewels. What are the institutions that open doors in our community and regulate its pulse? I choose Salt Lake Community College, and it is a home for incredibly focused Salt Lakers. Nearly 80% of their students work while going to school, many full-time jobs. If I could do college all over again, I would not be 33 and sitting on these damn student loans. And slick students aren't. 80% graduate with little to no student loan debt or save thousands knocking out credits before transferring to a four-year institution. Every day, Salt Lake Community College is transforming lives and communities through education. If you want to learn something new, refine a trade, or pursue a higher degree for the first time, explore your options at slcc.edu. Study alongside hard workers, save precious money, And be one in a class of 19, not 100. Spring is when leases expire, and if you're looking for a new or better apartment situation, try ICO. Here are four ICO communities offering leases right now. ICO Fort Union is the newest build in Cottonwood Heights. Something interesting here is three-bedroom work-live apartments, so you can live right above your business space. There's the Royce on 9th in Murray, where the old Kmart was. Big amenities there are poolside barbecues and a game time rooftop situation with a big TV and a fire pit. Now, if you move into the Devon at University Place in Orem, please invite us over because it has a podcast studio. And finally, Ico Station Parkway. This Farmington community is minutes from the Front Runner and Farmington Station. You can take virtual tours of all these apartments and get pricing at ivoryapartmenthomes.com. Well, you brought up a climate commitment, and my sort of third and final anxiety here is around environmental impact. We all watched during the Beijing Winter Olympics as they created snow with 49 million gallons of water. Of course, we just can't afford to do that in Utah. We've got a dwindling namesake, our Great Salt Lake, and there's no guarantees that we'll have a snow year like the one that we've had this year again, though pray for snow, it feels like is our official state motto. Um, 
How do we take our future water needs into account with a Winter Olympics? For us as winter athletes, climate is absolutely critical, right? It is the changing climate that is happening across the world is dramatically impacting winter sports. A lot of these athletes are coming out and speaking up about the importance of climate because it's affecting their ability to compete, right? Mm -hmm. This is a very important conversation that is circulating around winter sport. And so when we look at hosting a future games, you know, if we if we are selected as a host in 2030 or 2034, we are required to deliver a climate positive games. That is a requirement by the International Olympic Committee going forward from 2030 going forward. How is climate positive defined? Like what what would that mean? We will be measured on kind of what our carbon footprint is. We'll have to have a carbon management plan that'll be outlined for all games related activities. And we want to work with our host venue communities and establish sustainability committees across the entire kind of scope of the games as to what our impact looks like. And so we have been working with community partners like Utah Clean Energy, like Save Our Canyons, and starting to have those conversations ahead of time as to what sustainability looks like, what climate looks like. To your point, Allie, what are your concerns and how can we use your expertise and potentially even utilize some of your knowledge and resources to help minimize any impact that we have and to work collaboratively going forward over the next six to 10 years. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, really a standout within our work is this idea of we're, we're really trained to embrace our community advocacy groups. Sometimes people get afraid, mm-hmm. right, of engaging, but but we want to embrace them. We want to hear from you. We want to hear what your concerns are so that we can have a conversation. I mean, the thing about Salt Lake City, you know, is that we've already had the games and we do remember them as being a success, but they almost weren't, right? Like we almost blew it. The Salt Lake Organizing Committee tried to bribe the International Olympic Committee to secure the bid. There was like all sorts of different stories about corruption and shady goings on leading up to the games. This led to the ascension of Senator Mitt Romney. That's a little history lesson for anyone new here. So I guess the question is like, why risk it again? Like, is it not sort of exhausting to think about going through this again? And if if not, then... What are the lessons from O2 that the committee is is applying to this future bid? Yeah, I think one, it's significantly less risk than what we did last go around, right? Hmm. The last time we did this, we didn't have venues. We didn't have the people. We had just experienced a national tragedy with 9-11. Yeah. And everyone, a part of that organizing committee, all of the volunteers, right, They're the ones that came together and made this happen. And they did an outstanding job. And I think lessons learned from O2 and just kind of, I guess you could say, personal ideals that I have is making sure that we're transparent going forward and to have honest conversations and tell people what our limitations are and to really try to seek out, again, you, you hear me say this over and over, collaboration and partnership. And to have those conversations with our community and our stakeholder groups and say, this is what we can help with. This is what we are capable of and not try to over make promises that we can't deliver on. And again, I think this is a tremendous opportunity for our community and for our youth, right? We're the youngest state in the nation. I think our average age is like 30, 31. So you have an entire generation that's never experienced this and that want to experience it. And I think that's an awesome opportunity that not many states can be a part of and have. Well, it was thought that Salt Lake was going to be a shoe in for 2034, I think not just by Utahns, but it seemed broadly. But now I saw that it's possible we could be bumped to 2038. Is the Olympic Committee ghosting us? (laughs) We're not being ghosted. We're not being ghosted. Let me let me give you the scoop. (laughs) We are committed to a games in either 2030 or 34. We are not looking at 38. Okay. 
We are working very closely every single day with the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. We're working with the International Olympic Committee and then also just doing our preparation work for our candidature. And so our strategy has always been we want to be as far ahead as possible. Mm -hmm. I look at it again from the athlete perspective and the athlete mindset, right? I went to the line and I knew I had done everything possible to ensure the best performance I could have. And that's what we're trying to do with our work in completing the bid file and working with everybody is we want to position Utah in the best possible stance. I want it to be really hard for them to tell us no. (laughs) Um, They're leaving it all on the uh, rink. We're putting it all, (laughs) we're putting it all out there. We're trying to make sure that no boxes go unchecked. Right. And so we are focused on a 30 or a 34 games. Why is the preference 2034? Los Angeles 2028 will be happening. And so this gives us a little more time in the marketplace um, to activate Mm -hmm. with sponsorships and marketing. And I think it also honestly gives us a time to let Utah stand out. We hate getting overshadowed by Californians. (laughs) We hate this, Catherine. (laughs) Well, I'm You're speaking doing our my language. best <laughs> to make sure that doesn't happen. And so it gives us a little bit more time. But honestly, you know, again, circling back to everything that we've sort of talked about, it gives us time to really think about our impact. How confident are you? I feel good. You know, I am always, I think you'll take away from this, I'm a pretty positive optimistic person. So I'm going to lean into that and say, I feel optimistic and I'm very hopeful that this will happen. And, and Allie, I hope I'm making you a believer. (laughs) You know, my mom always says that sometimes people just need to feel heard. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So thanks for hearing me out. I love it. Because when I see the, the 75% of Utahns unquestionably are hyped to have the Olympics back, I'm like, We don't have questions? Like, I don't know. If you look at our venues, so you look at the Olympic Park and in the speed skating oval out in West Valley, we have made a very conscious decision to ensure that the community can take part. Mm -hmm. And so you as a community member can walk in and run around the track if you want, right? You can enroll your kid in a lesson And nine out of 10 times, they're probably being taught by an Olympian or Paralympian, right? I think a lot of times high performance or even professional sport community is sort of shut out a little bit at times, right? Like can't go into that building, you know, that's that's an off limits area. So we've really tried to make sure that there is this opportunity for community to be a part of it on any level. Right. And and I think that's part of why we see such high approval ratings is we really try to embrace the community into these facilities, into these programs and let them experience it. Catherine Rainey Norman, chair of the Salt Lake Olympic Committee for the Games, four time Olympian. Thank you so much for your time. You're so welcome. So at this point, Salt Lake City is a shoe in for the 2034 Winter Olympics. But state leaders are confident the IOC will lock it in this July. So Olympic dreamers, mark your calendars for July 24th. Yes, Pioneer Day. That's all for us today on CityCast Salt Lake. Thank you for listening. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more from around this city. Bye. <laughs>